Hello again. Can you all hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> okay, so as I was saying, we have several communications goals that are part of this campaign. One is promoting the new community vaccination center in East Baton Rouge. Another is promoting the vaccine hotline, which I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on in a second. The third is continuing to educate and raise awareness about the COVID situation in Louisiana, which I know Dr. Cantor will right. stay close by, Corey. I think someone is not muted. not muted. And to continue to build vaccine confidence. And there are a number of sub tactics under there that I, I won't get into for the sake of And happy to share this with you all afterwards. Um, some of you may have seen this already, but I just wanted to, to flag it. There's a, a new poll, or I should say the latest poll and focus group by the De Beaumont Foundation and pollster, renowned pollster Frank Luntz. Um, and this was a very recent, April 15th and 16th. And here were a few of the key so on, on vaccine, on vaccine confidence. Um, it was encouraging in that it found that overall vaccine confidence is increasing. Um, and that actually the partisan divide on vaccines is decreasing, but that there are a few um, reminders for all of us in terms of what's the There's I don't know if think he's lying. Hey. I think someone is not muted. Um, and in terms of what those are, they found that talking about potential booster shots, um, pointing to Fauci, Dr. Fauci, um, being prescriptive over the vaccines or, or judgmental, that, that really is a flashpoint. That those don't work. They do not resonate among some of our more vaccine hesitant audiences. So I just wish you well with it. Out beautifully for you. It won't, but I hope it does. I don't think it will. Can we ask the host, Karuth? Can can you, as as host, can you please mute everybody except for the speaker? That's what we're trying to do on our end. Hold on. Can everyone please mute themselves if we're unable to do it? Okay. And then in terms of what does work, um, they continue to find, and this matches what we have found um, through, through the Louisiana Public Health Institute surveys um, and through other national evidence out there that um, one's personal doctor continues to be the most trusted source of information, that sharing facts, answering questions, removing barriers, um, sharing per your own personal vaccine story, that those all do work. Those are all tactics and messages and messengers that still work. Um, and then interestingly, and, and Dr. Cantor might speak to this in a second, um, didn't find, um, a, you know, we, we were very concerned or a little concerned uh, about um, what the, the temporary pause on J&J on &J would do to, to vaccine confidence. And it actually found that there wasn't a major hit or there hasn't been a major hit yet. Um, I want to just spend a second on the vaccine hotline, which, as you'll recall, um, we stood up as part of this campaign on April 8th. Um, and so, so brand new hotline. Um, <clears throat> and it's really tackling multiple barriers to the vaccine. One, um, it is um, allowing folks to get their questions answered. Two, we extended hours. So it has extended hours into the evening, which we had heard from you all and from other stakeholders was really important um, for, for those who, who work at least one job during the day um, and maybe don't have time during the day to navigate um, the, the vaccine provider system during the day. Um, in addition, um, we know that there are, um, we know that medical professionals continue to be the most trusted source of information and yet many do not have access to a medical professional in their lives or in their communities. And so we knew that was important. And then obviously the, the, the biggest barrier here um, is that you know, those without internet access or those who are less tech savvy or just don't have the, the privilege or the access or the time to be able to spend um, navigating the vaccine um, provider system and, and scheduling, identifying where a vaccine provider is in their area and actually scheduling themselves for a vaccine appointment. Um, and so this hotline um, is the first actually in the state to be able to do that, can actually schedule you, find you vaccine in your area and actually schedule an appointment for you. 
since April 8th, um, and this is as of April 22nd, so sl slightly updated numbers than you just heard, um, the hotline has fielded nearly 2,000 calls, um, has scheduled 679 appointments. So remember, not everybody's calling to get an appointment scheduled. Some are, some are calling with questions. Um, and that, and this is this is exciting. Um, 446 individuals have called because they have questions they want answered by medical professionals, and so we are able to connect them to a trained medical professional who can answer their va their vaccine questions. So this is really encouraging to us, and again reminds us that um, we there there is still demand out there. Um, it just, it takes, it's, it's taking some creativity and it's taking some intentionality and, and work to identify those barriers and, and work to remove them. You, I believe you all have seen this before, but I just wanted to uh, share a couple of images of what some of our campaign materials look like. We do have these available in multiple languages. You're looking at a push card that we provide at vaccination events. And this is really the target audience here um, is individuals who have just gotten their vaccine and we're encouraging them to be, as you've heard Dr. Cantor say before, health ambassadors. We are encouraging them to, to share their story with family, friends, neighbors, colleagues. So we give them a few key vaccine facts um, and then we, we give them, um, you'll see down here, a couple of um, ways where they can share easily um, their, their vaccine selfies um, on social media. And this is a, I believe you all have seen this before too, this is our, our sticker over here. Um, and then this is actually a, um, an example of what the back of one of our door hangers looks like. So when canvassers are going out, this is one of the, the materials they're carrying with them. Um, and then here off to the right is a, um, a selfie banner. We, we sent one of these uh, to each region. And again, the idea, these are at our community vaccination events. Um, the idea is trying to make these, um, you know, these, these are already special celebratory moments, um, doing our very best to, to make them even more so and encouraging folks to, to share their stories. Um, because we know that friends and family continue to be among the most trusted source of information. Here are a few examples of what our digital and social ads have looked like. And one thing I wanted to show, let me stop sharing my screen, is, um, let's see, Mark had mentioned that uh, we sent out earlier this week 105,000 pieces of mail statewide. Um, I wanted to show you, in case you haven't gotten yours yet, um, this is what it looks like in person. So, um, and I, I'm happy to share what that looks like digitally. Um, but these are promoting specific Bring Back Louisiana vaccination events all over the state. And so with that, um, I'll wrap up and i um, eager to hear your questions and I'm eager for the brainstorm. Thanks so much. Uh, this is Daniel Xavier. I also had the opportunity to, uh, with Xavier uh, tool in collaboration with SEAL. Uh, call a seal and uh, some of what we've realized is that some of our organizations have been very proactive based on the activities and we have a Christian vaccine coalition in New Orleans so maybe we could consider and they're doing direct outreach with some of the churches. Uh, we also have uh, some of our folks who are reaching to us uh, maybe we could uh, send some information offline to see if there are possibilities of uh, retired pharmacists uh, and some other medical folks who are trying to go directly to where the uh, vaccine is needed. So they'll go to communities or churches, uh, but some of it is not budget neutral because of transportation and all the other stuff. So I'm not sure if there's opportunity to fund some innovative projects uh, that sort of takes the vaccine to folks who need it as opposed to come into a central location and they can work with churches and organizations. I love the little selfie um, shot about the shot. I think that's gonna be a big hit. Uh, this is Terry Davis. I have a question about the canvassers and working with Lucille, with Daniel and Tonette and Aaron, uh, they did a survey of canvassers and some of them were vaccine refusers. And so I wondered about recruitment and training of canvassers in the, um, 
it doesn't seem uh, like a good plan to send a vaccine refuser to canvas the neighborhood to promote vaccines. Also, I agree with Daniel. I think you've got to go to where people are and can get, whether it's their church or barbershop or wherever. So, so Allie, I, I'll, I'll take a shot at uh, just some of those uh, comments. So thank you, Ms. Brown, uh, for those comments. That Allie and those folks worked hard on, on those, those cards there. And then going back to uh, uh, Dr. Sarpan. Uh, so, so yes, we, we agree with you that, um, you know, we need to bring the vaccinations to the, uh, to the communities. Uh, that's why we're looking at uh, very closely at the mobile uh, vaccine uh, units. But we are definitely, as Dr. Levy said, we, we have to always be open to ideas of uh, innovation and creativity. And so, yes, we, we would definitely want to know, you know where those pockets of pharmacists are, where they are, and, and if there are opportunities for us to uh, partner uh, with them. Now, we have many partners, uh, but, but there's always um, uh, options for us to, to look at it. And then going back to what, uh, what Ms. Davis said, I, I agree. That, 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 that is a challenge. I do not know if that was a, uh, a prerequisite, uh, but, but typically, you know, I know there's a challenge. You, you don't want people baptizing you who haven't been baptized themselves. Uh, I know that can be <laughs> a challenge. Same difference when you're talking about uh, vaccinations. If our goal is to get folks to be um, vaccinated, we, we do want to work with people who are like-minded and, and I would agree that they would have a stronger story to tell if they were vaccinated themselves. So that's one we can take back and, and look at it and, and see um, wh wh where that one would, uh, would lead us there. So good feedback. I also have a follow-up question. In the script that I read from LPHI, the first question is, have you been vaccinated? That seems a little threatening or off-putting to me. How, how is that landing in the community? Mark, I'm happy to take that one if you'd like. Please, Matt. So no, and that's really good feedback. And actually part of our after action review is going to be sitting with the script, I mean, with all pieces of this operation and hearing feedback from our canvassing organizations, from our community partners um, about not, not looking at, at just the data, but looking at what, um, you know, what landed well and what didn't. Um, the scripts that I believe you're looking at is we've stressed is very much a talking guide. So not something that we've stressed folks should should stick to, um, but is more of a because what we're looking for here is um, at the end of the day is just an in person meaningful conversation. We want we want canvassers to connect with someone. We want them to sure there are there are questions we want them to ask. Um, but really want um, want it to feel natural, and so I think that's really good feedback, um, and certainly open to to um, to edits in future versions. Brief question: um, In terms of your hotline resources and messaging, um, what how have you approached, or how have you, in terms of the professionals working with the hotline, uh, questions that come up in the space of women's health and, and reproductive health questions, because that's been a big um, issue in many communities, um, you know, concern sort of breaking down fact versus fiction. And so I'd be interested to know how you're approaching those conversations through your hotline resources. Absolutely. And, and Mark, I'm happy to take a first stab at that one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, I, and we'd be happy to share um, the, there's some trends, trends reports that we receive on a weekly basis in terms of what, what are those common questions that we're getting through, through the clinical line of that hotline. Um, backing up a second, just a reminder that these, um, these call agents um, are, are actually our, our, our former contact tracers. They're our existing contact tracing workforce. Um, that we have then um, retrained to be able to pivot um, and be able to do this work when their when their workload is lightened. Um, there are um, medical professionals who, and sorry, you're hearing my my outlook um, beep in the background. Um, but there are medical professionals, trained medical professionals, who are part of that existing contact tracing workforce that have received a specific training um, by our immunization program director um, to be able to answer some of those questions. Um, and so that, and it includes around fertility um, because we, we have gotten specific questions on that. Um, I'd be happy to, to take that 
that question back and learn some more and follow up with you. Yeah, and, and for instance, there was just a, a release um, from the CDC in the New England Journal yesterday of, I think, our first preliminary sub substantial report about the experience with the uh, mRNA vaccines in, in women who are pregnant. Um, and so just making sure that that information is available to be updated in terms of those individuals who are interfacing with those kinds of questions in the community um, is going to be hugely important because you know, we're seeing that's a major, major issue um, in terms of uh, uptake for, for specific vulnerable populations. Absolutely. And we do, it, absolutely, that training does get updated and there are refreshers um, and check-ins that we do, but, but that's, that's excellent feedback and a good reminder. Uh, <clears throat> this is Dr. Wilts. I, I just got off another call before this one and um, with the National Minority Quality Forum. And one of the concerns is that not only trying to get people vaccinated, but at the same time, making sure they understand about uh, monoclonal antibodies and infusions that are available and leveraging that to, because that has been extremely disappointing that a lot of people still don't know about it. And uh, I know we're doing campaigns to get people vaccinated and doing the things we're doing, but um, unfortunately, I, I know I've had several patients that could have benefited that did not get it. Uh, and um, we, I, I don't know who's doing the data collection on the utilization, but that has been a big problem throughout this whole process. So while we're doing these community engagements, Dr. Sparkbrong mentioned about the, the SEAL committee and on that committee, and I think we need to concomitantly get that information out there, it's something to think about. Um, uh, as an add-on. I absolutely agree, uh, Dr. Wilkes. And so we'll, we'll take that one back. And there, there are many folks who could have, uh, would, would likely be alive today if they had received that information and responded in a timely uh, fashion. So I, I agree with you 100% that that needs to be a part of uh, some of our communication as well, what to do if you contract the virus and uh, you know if you, if you become symptomatic, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take that one back and hopefully we can report back on that one when we come back. Any other um, feedback uh, or? Yeah, I was also just to piggyback on what Dr. Wells was saying, maybe take the opportunities to sort of do broad education. Uh, so if there are some information that folks can benefit from, even if they're not receptive at the moment for the vaccine, the fact that you've given them additional information uh, communicates that you're interested in their welfare and they may give it a second thought. You know, I suppose you are need there to just get me vaccinated. Um, and also quickly to follow up with what Dr. Davis was saying, language is very important. And in one of our focus groups, they told us that vaccination has a negative connotation they rather say, did you get your vaccine or mm -hmm. did you get the shot? So the use of language could be a, dis, uh, a detractor. So uh, taking that also into consideration, I think have you gotten your shot seems to go over very well with people that have you been vaccinated. That's a really good piece of feedback. And something, one, one um, takeaway I'm, I'm hearing from this is that um, it, it would be wonderful to get feedback from this group on that script um, for whatever, whatever the next version of this of these pilots look like. And Allie, um, and Dr. Wilkes, I will remind you that just before the vaccine, the first vaccine was approved, we did have a complete campaign on the monoclonal antibodies and there um, are some documents and literature that was produced. Um, the governor and Dr. Kanner spent quite a bit of time talking about those and making sure that we were reminding people and advising them and making sure that we were also sending those antibodies to different facilities, including um, standalone facilities and not just hospitals for use. So you may wanna include those in the toolkits that go out so that we can spread that word. So thank you both. Um, Dr. Sarpong and Dr. Wilkes for those reminders that we do put those back in the toolkit as we're talking about the vaccines because those were in use just before the first um, two vaccines got approved and started. So they are definitely 
in use and we did increase the use of those drugs in Louisiana. And we have a plan to purchase and make sure they're available. So we just need to remind people. We also have a sheet that talks about the protocols for when you should ask for them. That's the critical piece because a lot of people weren't given that information, the ones that presented to ERs and if they didn't ask, then they weren't told. And um, by the time they, you know, if you're not connected with the HIE and you got the reports back, a lot of them it's missed the late. window. Yeah. So right. it was too late. To, once you're on oxygen at a certain level, it's too late to ask for it. So we need to, we need right. to make sure we're telling people what to ask for. Right. So yes, we um, definitely need to make sure that's included and people know when to ask for and what those are and the differences between the antibodies versus plasma treatment and all of those aspects. Absolutely. And yes, the tax person knows too much about medicine. <laughs> Thank you. You're doing good. Yep. Allie just dropped something in the chat. What is, you want to explain it, Allie? Sure, and I'm sorry, we, we talked about it several minutes ago, but um, wanted to just make sure you had it as a resource. It is a link to where you can learn more about the De Beaumont Foundation and, and Frank Luntz's work, um, in case you're interested. There's a, there's a lot of good information there, in case you missed it and are curious. Okay, thank you. These have been wonderful recommendations. Any other feedback that um, you all can give to Allie and Mark? I don't know how to bring this up, but I've had a lot of patients inquire that they heard about FEMA reimbursing for funeral expenses uh, that was put out there and there was no follow-up. I don't know if you all are aware that that came out that uh, people that would that died from COVID and uh, FEMA was about to, but I didn't hear it followed up. And we had a lot of families that had multiple members that died and it was a tremendous hardship. And there was some talk about FEMA reimbursing and not, that may not fall in our wheelhouse, but using that as a point of conversation also and talking with people. Um, do y'all have any information on that? Because I, I, I don't have any, I just was curious. So that's actually a part of the American Rescue Plan um, for the federal government to provide reimbursements for um, the funeral cost of those people who died from the COVID-19 virus during 2020. And it is a reimbursement through FEMA. Our, um, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security is supposed to be providing additional information on that. So when we do have the rest of the details, we will make sure that we send that through the health equity task force but it is a, a reimbursement for those funeral costs it's okay. to a set dollar amount and i think it's ten thousand yeah, dollars that's what i was told. i just know what didn't know where it was in the process that's and i don't enough. i haven't seen an update on that but we will make sure that we send that to the health equity task force thank but you. it was approved as a part of the american rescue plan thank you the other part I would just add that we make sure we're sending out is um, in relation to that, Dr. Wiltz, uh, is that early on, many of the death certificates did not list COVID-19 as the primary cause of death, it was cardiopulmonary failure or whatever um, the um, cause of death uh, from a, a biological standpoint was. And so I have talked to the vital registrar's office and know that they have prepared some guidance uh, for providers on how to update um, the um, death record. And so I think that that's something that needs to be shared with families because um, that has been a challenge. Thank you for bringing that up. That it's a, I know I'm gonna have to go back and look at, uh, and I think we all are. Yeah, we, we have, and, and they do have an established process um, to change it. So they would have to have COVID-19 as the cause of death in order to be eligible. Correct. It has to be the primary cause. And that was not generally what was being um, placed on the death certificate it was not the primary cause of death. So physicians are able to go back retrospectively and change that? Yes. The um, Louisiana Office of Vital Records has a process uh, by which to request an official change. And so that's why I was mentioning um, that that needs to be something that is included uh, and that information that's shared once we get documentation 
uh, on the details of the FEMA reimbursement, but they do have an established process and knew that they were gonna need to gear up to be able to, to have those death records corrected. It, it, would be, it would be great to have that, to work on communicating that with the State Board of Medical Examiners who can then put out bulletins to all licensed yeah. providers, uh, you know, physicians that would be responsible for those records. So to have, you know, some means of, of having that uni universally um, distributed throughout the state. So that- Yeah, if, I think that's, that's a great idea. Yeah, and the coroner's offices too, yeah. Yes. Also, is there an FAQ with the, uh, on the dashboard? And if so, maybe this can be addressed there, this question about fuel expenses and providing the update on um, where things stand with that. Because I'm sure there are a lot of people wondering about it. You're referring to the dashboard that um, Dr. Benjamin is? No, well, I was really referring to the, to the, LDH. Uh, yeah, the LDH dashboard, but I guess it could be on both dashboards. Mm -hmm. Is that possible, um, Dr. Benjamin? I mean, we can put in an out, I mean, make an announcement on it. I have a, a place for it on our dashboard. I mean, just, you know, if there's any place where you think that, that you know, the residents would, would be looking for this kind of information. Well, if you Google it, and if we put it, if we, if we put it on one of those sites and people was trying to search and it, it would be a place they can find information, uh -huh. if they just Googled the, the topic, it would come up. But just some way of people having an update because the, the media reports around, around the, the bill uh, talked about the fuel and expenses, but you know, just some yeah. way that people can know that that is still coming and it's being worked on and, it, you know, and where they can get information about it. We, we can work on that, Dr. Lavis, on, on looking for places where we can um, place that information. We do have a couple of FQH, uh, FAQs that are out there and, and we can look to see what's the best place to put it. Yeah, okay. That'd be good. Any other um, questions or feedback for Allie and Mark before we move to the next topic? I have a couple of comments. Um, I think that we are not doing a good enough job talking about the vaccine being free I think that that message has somehow gotten lost that we you don't, it doesn't matter if you have health insurance or what in health insurance you have, it is free to receive. I think that we also have not done a good enough job talking about that you don't need any sort of identification. I think we have a lot of undocumented immigrants, especially in the New Orleans area, who are scared of government. And I'm, I think that at the end of the day, many people on all sides of the political spectrum are scared of government. And however, we can make sure that they, um, their fears can be assuaged, that they're not going to get on some list to, to come get deported is very important. I think that also it's in the same vein, we need to be very mindful of the languages that we translate materials into and um, flyers that we make available to the public. Thank you. Any other um, feedback? All right, well, thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Thomas and Communication Director Neil. We appreciate the hard work that you are doing and um, we will continue to uh, provide you with feedback as, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank next, you. next on our agenda is uh, Dr. Joseph Cantor. He's our medical expert, our state health officer for LDH. I'm not sure if Dr. Courtney Phillips has joined yet, but we will um, certainly turn this over to Dr. Cantor and thank you for being here and tell us where we are. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Appreciate the invite, um, Dr. Lavise as well. Um, before I get into an update, I just dropped a link into the chat in response to um, Emily's comments. Now, HRSA, which is the overseeing body for the FQHCs, the federal agency under HHS, um, just last week put out some very strong provider language guidance um, pertaining to 
um, the prohibition on charging any individual patient for vaccine, the prohibition on demanding an ID as a barrier to receiving vaccine, and some other items relating to folks who might not have ID or who might be undocumented. It's uh, the strongest language yet that the feds have put out and it's uh, good to circulate around. So that, that's on the link I just shared. Um, the point being, just as Emily mentioned, um, people should be reminded that um, while it is acceptable to ask for insurance to recoup any payment that might be available there, um, the patient cannot be billed, period. The patient cannot be denied a vaccine if they don't have an ID are the two largest things there or a social security number or any other identifying information. Um, thanks for bringing that point up, Emily. And um, to Dr. Davis and Dr. Wills's point on the funeral reimbursement costs, um, the, you know, the, the Office of Vital Records is housed within Office of Public Health. And while we're not the main conduit for this reimbursement pathway, we, we do have a role to play and that being um, providing death certificates to families who need it. So um, the, 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 the Vital Records Office is the repository, not the originator of these death certificates. They don't have the um, authority to go in and change one if it needs to be updated, but they are aware that families will be coming in to ask for printed copies or new printed copies after it gets revised and they're prepared to um, serve the public that needs that. So um, that piece will be in play. And thanks Dr. Wilts for bringing that, that issue up. It's um, and Dr. Davis, it's, it's important for families to take advantage of this. I'll, I'll be relatively brief. Um, the, 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 the update I have is not, is not the most encouraging, so I'm gonna apologize in advance for that. But uh, I do have concerns with, uh, with, the, um, with the numbers we're seeing with uh, COVID, um, particularly in the context of some other national trends. You know, we had this, taking a step back, this very large spike our third spike, uh, the most deadly one we had yet over the Christmas and New Year's holidays. We were going down in all applicable measures for a couple months since that point. Then we stalled and we're flat. As of this past week, we're seeing the beginnings of uh, what could be rebound. Um, could be the beginnings of another spike. It could just be a little blip. You know, you often don't know until, until further on down the road, but regardless, uh, we're no longer going down and we're no longer stalled either. So percent positivity this past week for the state has gone up from 2.5 to 3.5 percent. Percent positivity on a regional basis has gone up on eight of our nine regions. The one balance region, region seven, the Shreveport area was dead flat um, in percent positivity. Incidents uh, or, or new cases being diagnosed day on day or week by week um, are going up at a statewide level now, are going up in seven of nine regions. And hospitalizations, you know, we made tremendous progress. We pushed our hospitalizations. We, we had not been below 500 hospitalized COVID patients throughout the state since, since our first spike in late March and early April. We were above 500 up until a few weeks ago. We were able to push it down well below that we got to um, just around 300. And now we're back up to around 330 or so and they've kind of blipped up there. So those are concerning trends. When we look more specifically by age, for the past two and a half weeks now, we've seen an increase in individuals aged 18 through 29 years old relative to the older age groups, which as we know from the prior spikes that we've had sometimes predicts a spike to come in the older age groups. We usually see the spikes first in the younger adults. Um, and then they serve as vectors to other in individuals. But all of that um, gives us concern. You know, we're obviously watching closely what's happening in Michigan. Michigan looks like they finally turned the corner, um, but they're awfully high right now. They had to cancel elective procedures in many hospitals throughout the state. And you know, really concerning to me is, um, you know, while, you know, we, we currently have between 31 and 32% of individuals in Louisiana having initiated the vaccine series. And, and that's, that's not insignificant, but that's not herd immunity. Michigan is a couple percentage points further along than we are, and it was not enough to protect them against the surge they just had. Um, so we have concerns. I, I have, you know, strong suspicion that a lot of this is due to the variant 
particularly the, the B117 or the UK variant. I'll tell you right now, of all COVID circulating in Louisiana, 33.3% is attributable to the UK variant. That's actually a little bit lower than the national average, which is 44.1%. Um, and it's lower than a couple of our big neighboring states. So for example, Texas is at 42.7%. Florida is just over 50%. But we've been going up substantially. And this time last week, we were around the high 20s percent. So um, the, the UK variant, the B117 continues to spread. We, we know it's more transmissible. It looks like it's actually more transmissible than we had thought even a few weeks ago, perhaps 65, 70% more transmissible. So those are our concerns. Again, I think it's too early to say what our trend is because it's just been one or two weeks of data, but we're clearly um, in the beginnings of rebound. I think we can safely say that. The good news with the variant is that the, the vaccines we have continue to be a really good match for it, um, continue to be a really good match. And as Dr. Lavis mentioned at the top of this, um, the dynamics with the vaccines have changed. And we were supply limited up until really a few weeks ago. Um, now we're not. We have more vaccine from the feds than we can use. Um, and the onus is on us, I think, to make the best use of it. I'll talk about the vaccine again in a second. I wanted to make one other comment on um, the racial demographics of vaccine administration. Um, there's been a lot of effort, um, granular on the ground effort to, to bring vaccine and, and, and engage conversations with, with communities and neighborhoods and, uh, and other you know, marginalized settings. I think it's paying off. Um, and I wanted to let you know that we, number one, have made steady but slow um, improvements in the demographics of our vaccine administrations, addressing the disparities week on week. And we also have some of the highest quality data in the country right now. And that's something that we're particularly proud of because it was not easy to get to that point. So as of this week of all vaccines administered in Louisiana, 28% have gone to black Louisianans. That's a percentage that each and every week since we started counting has gotten a little bit better. Not where it needs to be, but a little bit better each and every week. If you compare that to the population percentage of black Louisianans in Louisiana, which is 32.7%, that's 86% of what you would predict. Comparing that to US numbers nationally, 8.6% of all vaccine administrated nationally has been in black Americans and they constitute 12.4% of the US population, which gives a predicted number of 69% of predicted. So we're, we're doing better than national means in terms of addressing these disparities, not clearly not where we need to be, but, but doing better nationally. we also have much better data the CDC, these national numbers, the CDC only has racial information on 55% of every vaccine administered in the country. Because of the work that our team has done, namely our Bureau of Health Informatics and our ID EPI teams, um, we have data on 91% of vaccine administrations in, the US, in, in Louisiana. I remember when we first released the racial data, it was embarrassing because we were at 50% too. Um, and we had talked about it in this forum, there was a lot of work that went in, particularly the team was able to cross-reference with other data sources that we have. We have Medicaid data, we have hospital uh, discharge data. That was the same thing that we did with testing demographic data earlier on in this, in this pandemic. Um, and we've actually been able to coach other states in this too. So the quality of our data far, far exceeds national uh, data right now. And that's something that I think you know, we're certainly proud of. So I wanted to wanted to share it with you. Talking a little bit more um, about the vaccine, you know, I think we're in this phase where um, we can use all the help that we can get, and um, there's no no bad ideas. Um, you know, the the very beginning of the vaccine rollout was limited severely by supply, and we were triaging where vaccine was going based on who was most likely to get complications or who is most likely to be exposed. Healthcare workers, people in nursing homes and so forth. 
The second phase, when we were able to open up eligibility, we had a rush of interest. And um, people that were highly motivated to get vaccinated found a way to do so and had the means to do so. Um, we're now in this phase where we're, we're, we're trying to target people who either um, have questions, you know, not a hard no, but, but have questions, or they, they plan to get vaccinated. They just perhaps have not felt the urgency to do so, or they still have barriers to access. Um, continuously, when we talk to people and do polling, it's, um, we don't see a lot of adamant no's. We see a lot of people in the middle who uh, we believe can be brought along to be vaccinated if, if we address the barriers, if we address their concerns, if we um, engage those conversations. Um, it is frustrating to have more vaccine than we can use right now. That's a frustrating place to be because we're looking at these variants and we're doing all we can to avoid another surge and no one wants to institute more mitigating measures. We'd much rather increase vaccinations as their way to protect against that. Um, but it's but it's it's challenging. So um, you know, at this point, it, it's clear that the ground game is going to um, be where we need to spend time. Very encouraging that the pilots, you know, will really begin in earnest this weekend. And you know, I think our position at this point is if if there's any community group, organization, church, any any opportunity out there to um, engage with folks in their own territory, so to say, um, in a place that they feel comfortable with trusted community leaders, uh, we wanna partner in that because I think this next phase is gonna be a more deliberate phase. It's gonna be a slower phase. It's gonna be really going on the ground, bringing vaccine to people. And that's gonna take time and it's gonna take partners. And um, you know, I think we need all the partnerships that we can get right now. So that's that's my ask to this group is, is to, um, help us in this next phase connect with, with, with opportunities. It's, um, it's gonna be more deliberate and slower, but I think that's the only way to make, to make sustained gains from where we are now. Dr. Brown, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yeah, at this time we'll turn it over for questions. Basically, you know, it, everyone on the call is scattered all over the state of Louisiana. Are you all experiencing any issues or, or barriers in, in your specific locations that, um, you know, maybe we could bring to the forefront and discuss. I think uh, just what you described, Joe, is what's that? We uh, had that initial rush. We had a waiting list on the hotline, uh, you know, working our way through it. Now we're getting more targeted. And um, uh, I think the canvassing is going to be important. Um, um, <laughs> You know, I, I like to tell those that are hesitant. Uh, I, I always quote Bill Withers and uh, just the two of us when he has that line in the song that good things come to those who wait, but not to those who wait too late. Uh, so don't wait too late to get it. Uh, and then the um, I've really been pushing hard in uh, the African-American community. This is one of the first times in history that uh, we have a president and a governor where black folks are being put first in line. And I can't is that enough? Because historically, you know, we've always been not that way. And, uh, and you have an intentional president, an intentional governor that really prioritized. And when we received the vaccine, that was the charge of black and brown and people of color to be, uh, you know, uh, prioritized. And uh, that resonates with some folks, um, you know. Um, it, but I, it, I think we always knew that was going to be the hardest part, that last cell. Uh, to that group that that just needs more and more convincing. Uh, and then we do have a segment. I mean, the political reality is there's a, there's a group out there that um, are, um, and I think all the polls are showing it. I mean, they're described as, I guess, Trump Republicans that, you know, I know that there was supposed to be some uh, outreach to them that I think uh, NASCAR and country music and some other venues. Um, we have those populations in our FQHC system and not the majority, but that is a hard conversation. Um, you know, I feel very culturally competent, <laughs> but that is a challenge uh, trying to reach, uh, reach that, that, that group. And um, uh, it, that, that, as we all know as, as clinicians, that state of readiness is something that you have to 
you know, uh, work your, war your way towards. But um, I think we're just going to have to keep going after them and, and targeting them. And um, I don't have an answer. I just know that we will be persistent in, 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 in trying to reach them. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't think it's the, there are some pockets where transportation access is an issue, but that doesn't seem to be the big issue that we're seeing in the community. Uh, we're having events now where folks, um, you just have to, you, you, I guess you meet people where they are and know where they, uh, I know, um, I think Lenore's on from United Home Nation. She mentioned that canvassing won't work in that population. You know, they won't, it has to be someone from that community. And I think we, we still know that that to be true. So uh, that's not an answer. It's just uh, acknowledging uh, Dr. Brown, what you asked of what we're seeing on the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. You know, I'll add, we um, are really trying to put vaccine into smaller and smaller medical practices now, uh, more ambulatory settings. Ali had mentioned this, but, you know, polling and focus groups across demographics and across political ideologies, one constant, even amongst people that have deep mistrust of the government on both political sides, um, still trust their own physician or their own provider. Um, so that's an opportunity for us. There's, there's challenges because the packaging of the vaccine makes it tough. And when you have a 10 or, you know, Moderna is actually soon to be in a 15 or 14 dose vial. When you have that in the clinic setting, it's, it's logistically yeah. complex and you either accept a lot of waste or you don't vaccinate anyone after, you know, 1 PM in the afternoon. It's, um, it's a hard choice to make if you're going to pop a new vial for, for a patient that comes in much more easier if it was a single dose vial. We have made that ask um, loud and clear to the feds as have a number of other states. And I think that message is, is getting through, but I, I think, and, and you know, particularly looking ahead, Pfizer is gonna be authorized for individuals down to 12 years old in the imminent future. And that popu you know, the pediatric population is used to getting vaccinated in their pediatrician's offices. So we're gonna have to make it easier for them to um to do that i would miss be remiss too that the, the whole j and j jitters thing that causes a lot of setback yeah. that now people are saying i don't want that so that's going to make it difficult for us uh we have we got one more hurdle to overcome so that, yeah that's i had a uh, thanks for I, i'd actually meant to mention that dr Wilts. i just forgot the um the 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 advisory committee on immunization practices is is, is meeting as we speak right now um, to talk about J&J, &J. you know, we, we expect them to vote and, and really solidify a path forward on J&J &J at this meeting. I, I can give you an up kind of been following along as, as they've been discussing today. I can give you a quick update. There, there, there were a, a small number of additional cases that the CDC collected data on. So now they're up to 15 cases um, of this um, thrombotic thrombocytopenia event, which is very rare. I've never seen anything like that, certainly in my medical career. Um, of those 15, three, three have died. They still are all women, although there's a couple other cases they're looking at that might be men as well. It's analogous to the, the AstraZeneca experience in Europe, and some of those were men as well. It looks like what they, there's two options. They might just put it out with a warning label, um, or they might actually recommend restricting it to a certain type of person, maybe men or maybe women above the age of 50. It looks like they're probably going to put it out with a warning label. They did just really like a half an hour ago, put out an interesting stat that I wanted to share with you because I mean, it's going to be, um, I mean, we're going to need Johnson & Johnson back in circulation. It's, 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 it was a much more popular vaccine than we had thought it would be. Um, so we're going to need it back as an option. Um, this is the stat that um, over the next six months, if this is based on modeling, over the next six months, if Johnson Johnson was reintroduced into the into the into use without restrictions, there would be 26 additional cases of this clotting event. There would be 2,200 prevented hospitalizations from COVID, and 1,400 prevented deaths from COVID. Pretty pretty stark numbers speaking to the risk benefit calculation here. So. So that, that actually brings up a, a question I was going to ask the, the, the group um, that, you know, so um, so most people are not really good at, at understanding the concept of risk. And, um, you know, for people who are trained and, you know, 
the way we are, we, we, we think like that. What, what arguments are you finding to be most effective about people who are, are, are vaccine hesitant? I mean, is, is it an argument about risk? You know, they're talking about the, the relative risk of the vaccine versus the risk of infection, or is it other other arguments? And I think uh, I'd like to hear people's experience and, you know, whether or not we can kind of see what types of messaging seems to be most effective, especially on the one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, so I can speak to that for the reproduct for the obstetric population. I mean that. You know, we le I leverage in, in direct communications the specific data that we had, you know, in the fall about the threefold risk of ICU admission and, and being on a ventilator if you were pregnant versus non-pregnant, and that that, you know, enhanced risk for a, for a vulnerable group, you know, was one narrative that hopefully would be compelling in terms of um, uptake uh, or, cons or at least cons being more considered considered in terms of you know, that as an option. And I found that to be useful and effective. It's not universally you know, um, accepted, but I, I think using that approach does leverage, is a, is a leverage point. This, this is Keith. Uh, I had a clinic today, the young man didn't want to get vaccinated. He was healthy. The New York Times article about the 20 uh, year old who worked in a nursing home unvaccinated, had COVID, brought it into the nursing home, 22 people got sick, one of them died. So my message to him was, um, you might not get sick and die, but if you get COVID and you bring it to an older person or somebody who has disabilities, you could really hurt somebody. So anybody who's working in service, who's working with the public, and especially if they're working around older persons, we need to appeal to their humanity in terms of they become a carrier, they can really hurt somebody if they're not vaccinated. The other thing that I brought to his attention, he's an ex-athlete, was uh, watching the NBA over the last several weeks. I had kind of already come to the conclusion that these guys weren't playing whole games. They're sitting out 10 minutes here and 15 minutes here. And my perception is many of those players are having long COVID, which we now know is in 30% of people, even with milder forms of disease. Jason Tatum, who plays for the Boston Celtics, now says he's short of breath and has to use an inhaler on a regular basis. So I appeal to this guy, I say, look, you're healthy, you're fine, you might not die, you might not be hospitalized, but if you get sick, it could affect your athletic status and your ability to perform. So those are the two things I do with those younger persons. Um, one is the long COVID, which has now been well documented. And the other is their potential of causing death and disability to older persons and people with disability. Following up on that, uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Ferdinand is very persuasive, so I'm sure he did take the, the vaccine in the end. The um, one of the things I, I think that I think we missed an opportunity when the risk benefit ratio and people are saying this one in a million. Well, at that time we had given seven million almost J and J. It really was one at seven million, which uh, you know, just numerically, that makes it a, a even rarer incident with the one uh, case. The other thing that I've I've been uh, pushing J and J, it was tested against a broader uh, population than uh, the other two, and uh, I think because of that richer experience, it was uh, more effective in my mind. And the final thing I tell people, if I'd have had a choice, I'd have taken J and J. Now I've already taken Moderna, so it's all, it's a done deal, but. I, <laughs> that's my final uh, hard sell is that if I had been, been given a choice in the beginning, I would have taken that one. And uh, sometimes that. If I could make one other point totally unrelated to the patient I saw today, uh, the medical students were trying to vaccinate some of the persons living with homeless situation here in downtown New Orleans. We have a, a large cadre of people, even after they were moved into hotels, they're now back under the bridge and around City Hall. And the J&J &J would have been life-saving for that group of persons, not because you're giving them a cheap vaccine, but because it's one and done. It's kind of hard when you don't have a permanent place of residence to get an MRA vaccine and come back in three weeks or four weeks, come back to where? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. 
Well, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, this is from, oh, Allie posted something about the hotline and uh, Amy Lesson from Dillard. Uh, Dr. Kanner, is it possible to get some of these stats regarding percentage or different variants, which, which regions are flat, which regions are going up and how much? Yeah, I will, um, I'll drop a comment into the chat right now. It, it's all in one form or another, either on ours or the CDC's website dashboards, but I'll, I'll summarize the stats I just gave into the chat in, in, in a second. Thank you, thank you very much. And did that address what you needed, Dr. Lesson? Yes, absolutely. I think, I mean, I know a lot of people um, who are uh, teaching public health right now and who are doing community outreach are concerned specifically about what percentage of different variants are in the Louisiana population right now. And we're watching that pretty closely. So getting having updated information about that is really helpful, especially. <laughs> At one time, we thought it was over 125 cases in the Lake Charles Calcasieu area, um, but I'm not sure if that has changed of the variant. Yeah. And Thank then Do um, Kimberly Robinson, um, Secretary Robinson has posted the COVID-19 funeral assistance line in the chat. And she also has listed the eligibility criteria for the funeral assistance which states that, you know, uh, about the death certificate must indicate death. And also that they have to provide funeral expense documents, receipts, funeral home contracts, et cetera. Okay. Any other feedback for Dr. Cantor while we have him here or questions? I had one other question. The Absolutely, other, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but it. I'm, I'm concerned, and I don't know if a decision has been made, but one of the other big barriers we're seeing is that people, for whatever reason, are thinking that they're getting a more relaxed attitude. I know we're bumping up on that 100 days that the president, uh, you know, what he uh, uh, projected for vaccinations, and he's, you know, we've exceeded that as a country. And I'm concerned uh, about the uh, mask mandate that other states seem to be uh, relaxing. Uh, if that happens, I think that's going to offer. I mean, that's going to present a, one more challenge for us. And I don't know if that, if you know, if that is on the horizon. <laughs> I guess that I think that's going to complicate things uh, again. So, this. Yeah, I don't have great info. I mean, it's it's an active conversation. The governor's expected to make a decision in advance of the Tuesday, this coming Tuesday press conference, which is when it'll be announced. The current order <clears throat> expires this coming Wednesday and needs to be renewed. It, it's been a really um, active conversation. I don't, I, I couldn't say which way it's, it's going to go right now. Yeah, it's been worrying me, but uh, we'll, we'll see. All right, thanks. I mean, Dr. Canner, you know, with with respect to the J&J &J vaccine and sort of this has come up in conversations with several colleagues that, um, you know, in essence, in this context, we, what we're seeing sort of, I guess, at a global and a national level is a real time sort of clinical trial where adverse events are being sort of public re publicly reported as they occur. Um, and so the perception is much different where in the traditional context, you know, these adverse events would have been evaluated and navigated in a traditional clinical trial in a research setting. And by the time the medication or vaccine was released, we basically have, you know, there's a small risk of this, small risk of that, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but it's not, it wouldn't be presented the same way. And so I don't know, I mean, I know at this point it's, it's difficult to walk that back, but if there's a way to, to sort of change that narrative you know, that would be important because, you know, any medication that we use as clinicians, we know that there are small risks of adverse events that are probably higher than what we see with J&J, &J, um, you know, and, and other, you know, and other, other things. But now the perception is, you know, just a few events, you know, frighten the country. So it, it's, it, it is a challenge. I, I totally agree, Dr. Maupin. The, um, 
you know, I'll say two messaging points that have been helpful for us with that are, well, first, you know, it's these, these trials. I mean, the J and J trial, like the Pfizer Moderna, was a big time trial. I mean, forty thousand people. You know, half of them got placebo, half got drug. That's a big time trial, but that's not seven million. So there's there's something to be expected when you extend that to a population. You know, the 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 salient points that we found effective on this. Number one is um, if anyone harbored concerns about how serious the federal agencies take safety, you know pulling the trigger to pause or pulling the plug to pause after only six events is a dramatic and profound statement of how serious they take this. Um, they're not being cavalier with safety nor are they being cavalier with transparency. And, and that's important. And the other point is, I mean, it's, it's miraculous that those six cases were able to be identified so quickly. I don't think that would have been possible 25 years ago. And that same safety monitoring apparatus is also in place for Moderna and Pfizer and has not identified such concerning issues, which should give people even more confidence about that. Um, we're doing a good job of monitoring in the state. It's one of the things that we do very well. We have an excellent ID epi section. We've not had any of these cases, these thrombotic thrombocytopenic events in, in Louisiana. We're also monitoring breakthrough cases and you know, people that get Confirm positive 14 days or longer after being vaccinated. We currently have 367 breakthrough cases. That's 0.03% of everyone who is fully vaccinated in Louisiana. Of those 367, 21 have been hospitalized or 0.002% of everyone who's been fully vaccinated. And, you know, those that's to be expected by the data behind these trials, even probably better than what the data, I mean, 94, 95% efficacy, you know, predicts would be even more than that. But um, we're trying to be as transparent as possible with this data because we want people to know that the safety monitoring doesn't end when the trial ends, you know, it continues on. I have one other small question and I don't want to prolong this, but there's some concern that people are now saying that natural immunity will be added to the vaccines to reach herd immunity. But we know of the variant in Brazil, the P1 and the P2 in Manus, Brazil, they had a horrible surge in April and May of 2020. That's the, the place for those who don't remember where you saw the open ditches with the bulldozers pushing bodies into it. And they're almost back to square one. So they weren't protected by natural immunity uh, nine months after their first surge. Do we have any messaging or are you looking at that and perhaps the flattening and the small upward tick that we're going to see in the United States, like we see in Michigan, might be that the natural immunity loses some of its protection against the variants? Yeah, th there's no question it does. I mean, we've reinfection is clearly a thing now. I mean, clinically, I've seen people now that have infect infected for a third time. I've, I've seen a handful of people that have been infected for, for a third time. So clearly it's not protective. Folks are less likely to get sick, um, real sick on reinfection, it seems, but they can clearly get, get reinfected. The other fallacy in those type of arguments and the, the Governor Abbott of Texas made that argument last week when he tried to do some back of the envelope math is, um, you know, a lot of, of the 31% of people that, that have been vaccinated or started the vaccine series in Louisiana, I mean, a number of those also had COVID. <laughs> So you can't just add that number to the people that have been diagnosed with COVID because, you know, a lot of those are overlapping with each other. So it's, um, I don't, I agree with you. It's, it's, it, it gives me concern when people take uh, comfort in those type of calculations. Dr. Kanner, uh, there's been a recent uh, report um, that if you have had COVID, you may only need one of the mRNA vaccines that you may not need the booster. Is that any validity to that? Because I'm being asked that quite yeah. a bit. The data is compelling. It's not yet a formal recommendation. It very well might be a formal recommendation down the line. Um, it was initially discussed when we were more supply limited as a way of preserving doses. Now that we're not supply limited, I mean, I would, I would personally recommend anyone to get the full series of Pfizer or Moderna, regardless of whether they've had it. 
it's possible the CDC might come out down the road and say they may consider only getting one if they want, but I mean, we've, we've got the doses on hand. So, uh, I mean, it might as well be safe than sorry is, is my perspective. That, that's primarily coming from, you know, a lot of individuals who are needle pho phobia. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, can I get just one if I've had COVID already? I know. I mean, it's tough. I mean, a lot of people have phobia. I guess, you know, I'm going to tell them, like, if, if you were to get COVID and get sick, you're going to get a lot more than two needle sticks out sure. of that illness. That's a super important message, though, because I, I actually met, I had a, a pregnant patient this morning who I was discussing, you know, the prospect of vaccination. And she said, well, you know, I had COVID last year, um, you know, when this all exploded and, you know, had some reservation as to whether she needed to get vaccinated now. And so I do think our messaging, uh, because so many of our, you know, of our, of our neighbors and, and friends, et cetera, and, you know, this is this has been our prior narrative. It doesn't mean that you step back from using um, the resources of vaccination. Um, and, and I do feel that there is some, there is a, a, a myth about that, where there are a significant number of individuals who are not participating because they said, "Well, I had it, you know, six months ago or eight months ago, and so, you know, I'm I'm probably okay." And, and that's just not the case. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that one too. I've heard people make that argument. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, feedback, comments? All right. Well, thank you as always, Dr. Cantor, for you know showing up and being present and giving us, you know, all of the information that you have in, in real time. And I know it's evolving and it's changing, but we appreciate you keeping the task force up to date. My pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Thanks to everyone else for what you're doing. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. So at this time, I think we've done some preliminary brainstorming. Um, Dr. Lavise, did you want to open it up for more brainstorming? Um, Right. Well, I, I think when a, a, a question we can brainstorm around is uh, additional activities of the task force. You know, what what should we be doing at this point? Uh, particularly, what should we be doing that maybe we're not doing? You know, are, are there any other things we can add to our agenda or the activities of the task force? So any ideas um, I think would be helpful. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, so many people have their cameras off, we can't even tell if they're there. You know, I don't know who we're, we're talking to. You know, I think a lot of the good work in, that, that's being done, um, uh, maybe revisiting some of the other states, uh, not, uh, not some to add to the agenda, but kind of see the progress of other states. In, in, the, in the beginning, you brought in some other folks just to see how they're progressing and, and you know, maybe some strategies that they have put together. Um, I think a lot of us are on, on various committees that uh, have data that, um, like Dr. Sarprong mentioned earlier with the, the SEAL committee, uh, maybe leveraging some of the things that some of these other uh, uh, task force are involved in, uh, piggybacking on with them or looking at some of their data sets to, to make sure that uh, we're all kind of on the same page and, and, you know, same messaging, uh, that, that might be helpful just to kind of revisit that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I know you had reached out, uh, you and Dr. Brown had reached out to the, the National Task Force, Equity Task Force. Have they been uh, communicating any new strategies or things that they are looking at doing? That's the uh, NGA, the national yeah. government. You mean that? Or, well, there's two. There's the National Governance so, Association that brought together the state task forces like ours. And then there's the task force that came out of the, uh, the uh, Biden administration during yeah, the transition. Yeah. They reached out to us to, right. and, uh, to model uh, how their task force would be set up. I really haven't heard anything from them uh, since then. Have you heard anything? I haven't. I haven't. Yeah, I was just curious. I haven't. 
Now, NGA, they still meet, you know, so I know that NGA is still active. And, you know, I hear from time to time from people in other states, mm -hmm. like I've kind of kept up with North Carolina and Maryland um, and what yeah. they're doing. Um, I sat could... in on the NGA this past week and it's more of, I mean, everybody is where we are as far as okay. trying to get arms and shots, you know, and all their strategies are you know, on a national level, we're just not where we should be and ought to be at this time. And that everyone now has uh, an excess of vaccines, the supply far outweighs the demand. So we're seeing that. I'm looking in the chat. Um, has anyone seen any, has, I, I recently saw a discussion about providing incentives to people to get vaccinated, small incentives to people to get vaccinated. Has anyone seen that? Or what are people ideas about that? Yeah, like Krispy Kreme donuts. Well, a bit more than that. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that I saw that. <laughs> you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the MCOs um, offer uh, incentives to patients to get preventive screenings and things like that. And, you know, they'll give them give them gift cards for taking the flu shot. And uh, so that might be an area to explore if they can look at their data sets and seeing how many of their members are, are, are getting the, the COVID, uh, even though it's not being billed for, that might be a population you could run a list off and target and, and offer that. They do it right now. I mean, they, they do give incentives for, I mean, Medicare, if you do an annual wellness visit, if you have AFLAC, they will give you incentives if you come in and get uh, you know screenings and things like that so that might be something uh the, to worth exploring yeah i know yeah. we've had some conversations with the nursing home industry about this issue uh getting more of the nursing home uh, staff to uh, accept the vaccine they've had a very low uh acceptance rate there as well and you know we've talked about that but you know one of the other issues with it is that the incentives actually could stoke additional distrust that people feel that, you know, why are you so invested in me getting this vaccine? You know, that it's this unsafe vaccine that was True. rushed, hurried, hurriedly uh, developed, and you're so insistent that you're willing to pay me to do it. Um, <laughs> you've got to really be careful how you how you message around that. And yeah. my, my uh, advice to the nursing yeah. home is to be careful with that. And I, I've heard pros and cons to it, um, the incentives. Yeah. I would say that, you know, if if our messaging and communication subcommittee could can consider some best practice recommendations to provide and to sort of link in with um, provider groups, i.e. physician, nurse practitioner groups, which are, because I think we heard earlier that the providers are actually considered to be the most effective trusted, trusted messenger. Uh, for many patients that, they, you know, their personal physicians or their personal nurse practitioner, um, you know, maybe one of the most effective resources. And so um, I know a number of groups that I've connected with, they, they're interested, how can they be more effective as a, as a medical association or society in, in communicating? Um, so if our colleagues that, you know, have worked with that group can provide some, you know, best practice resources directly to the provider community so they can be more skilled um, in the types of messages that, that resonate. Um, that might actually be very constructive because I know many of our hospital centers, except, you know, for them to sort of now create their own resources and tools, if we already have some things that we know work, maybe sharing those things as a blueprint would be, would be one useful exercise. Dr. Brown, wow, this is Dr. Whitfield. I wanted to make a real quick comment. We mentioned earlier about how the president and the governor was on board. And unfortunately, that is not always a positive thing. And I'm kind of piggybacking off what you guys said earlier about the incentives. Some people look at that as like, well, what's really going on? Like, why are we targeting African-Americans? Why do they have to get first? Not understanding that this disease is truly taking us out. And so, again, I think the personal physician conversation is where we're going to be most successful. Of course, the campaigns, things that we're doing on the ground is great. But that interaction with the patient I mean, I have a code that I, that I use when I'm talking to these patients, vaccine counseling. And I can't tell you how many times I've had to say patient refused vaccine. Um, and so, but again, I'm not dismissive. I'm not insulting to them. I understand 
I asked them to continue the mitigation strategies that they're doing, continue masking, continue washing hands, and we'll have the discussion on follow-up when I recheck your blood pressure. And so I've been successful sometimes in that second conversation. Maybe someone has died. They know someone has gotten infected. Someone had a bad outcome. Okay, doc, well, what were you saying about the vaccine? Which one do you recommend? But it's going to take some conversation, and it's it's a it's a long haul, as y'all you guys know. It's not just Tuskegee. I mean, we just recently had an incident at, at our Lady Lake Hospital with a physician who 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 did something to a Southern University student. I don't want to go into the details on that, but um, it's uh, more reasons why African-Americans are still fearful, and, and not just African-Americans, but just people with the government and all the stuff that happened politically. So I just wanted to make that, that comment. Uh, that, that's Dr. A good point. Dr. Dr. Mobin makes, makes an extremely good point. The uh, physician community needs to be strengthened in their ability to communicate especially since our charge looks at uh, racial ethnic populations and disadvantaged populations. And I, I would include the homeless persons living with homeless situation. So maybe we should have a webinar, not talking ministers, not talking just lay persons, but specifically talking clinicians, uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants and pharmacists on messaging overcoming COVID-19 for those who serve racial ethnic minorities and disadvantaged populations. And some of the things we discussed today, I really think we're not thinking clearly about this plateau and uptick. With vaccinations coming on board, we should see a plunge like we saw in Israel. And what we may find when we do more genetic testing is that the variants are more ever present across the United States than we know because we're not really testing for that. I think Michigan speaks to that. Michigan's vaccination rates are better than Louisiana, but they have horrible uptake. And again, I challenge everyone to look up Manus Brazil, M-A-N-A-U-S, where they had a huge surge in the spring and they're, they're back to square one. I don't think we're going to be back to square one, but there is going to be an opportunity over the next several weeks for us to re-energize and to give some spirit and knowledge to our practitioners because this thing is not going to go away easily. Dr. Ferdinand and I agree. In, in, in our office, we're working with uh, Dr. St. Uh, Kirkpatrick uh, in North Louisiana, whose students are presently looking at uh, what uh, information is useful uh, in getting uh, vulnerable populations, in particular uh, minority individuals with disabilities, uh, the elderly, uh, what is uh, what um, is helpful health promotion information that comes from a provider? How should it be delivered to them via a provider? And so right now he is he his students are researching this, and the findings will be utilized in a uh, webinar that we will be doing at some point this summer. And so uh, the, the Health Equity Task Force will be a sponsor of that. And so we would, I would love to have uh, you, you on and possibly others on this call uh, to talk about it because the overall intent of the session is to help build providers' ability to know what to say and how to say um, when trying to get vulnerable populations vaccinated so that they are most effective and that they don't offend because oftentimes people are coming from a place of, it's just a vaccine, just take it. And they don't know how harmful that can be. So I just wanted to say that. Also wanted to say, I do recall that uh, Dr. Levise and Dr. Brown in the recommendations that you guys sent a while back, uh, and I recently added it to some CDC funding uh, that of which uh, the Health Equity Task Force, I meant uh, Health Equity Task Force will be a funded partner. Uh, hopefully we get it and we will fund the Health Equity Task Force. But in it, I, um, you guys talked, I mean, I outlined that there would be an establishment of a speakers bureau, but I pulled that idea from a recommendation that you guys uh, had. But in it, I just detailed out more that the speakers bureaus would be made up of uh, identified providers in each respective health district, identified lay people in each respective health district uh, that are gatekeepers to each of these individuals, I mean, are to each of these uh, health districts that can possibly uh, be, we can utilize whenever we need to so that we can, they can carry messages to us, I mean, to carry messages into their communities 
because we're finding, and as all of you know, that uh, what I'm hearing from individuals is the reason that they got vaccinated is somebody else got vaccinated that they know, and they were they saw that they were okay, or they told them that it was okay. And so I think um, one that webinar uh, it, is coming this summer, and would love to have people's participation on it. And then two, I think uh, hopefully, and I, I think we are going to get funded. Uh, would love to put funding behind that uh, speakers bureau idea to identify providers and also lay people inside each health district who would be known persons who can go and speak to vaccine hesitation. Uh, because I think this is going to be a step-by-step -step situation uh, that, that's going to have to happen. Yeah. So, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this going to be the, the July webinar to piggyback onto what Dr. Ferdinand is recommending, is this going to be by providers for providers? Yes, it's going okay. to be by providers. Yeah. Uh, I've already asked Dr. Cantor to participate. So it would be Dr. Cantor. Uh, it would be uh, Dr. Santaman, who's a researcher. Um, I've, uh, I think I had also asked um, uh, Dr. Ebony Price as well, uh, pre probably two weeks ago, and um, if others. Um, and so the, the details have not been mapped out, right, but it's right. specifically for providers talking to providers. Right. Is this, uh, uh, Dr. Ferdinand, is this your, what you were targeting, Dr. Ferdinand? Yeah, uh, I put it into the chat, the story on the unvaccinated nursing home worker, and Dr. Levice had actually made a comment about them having difficulty with their workers. Uh, our human nature that allows us to survive is to believe that tomorrow is going to be a better day. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the unvaccinated workers in the nursing home, we've had this very well documented case where the multiple of the older persons got sick and one died. And the reason for that is the vaccines were studied in healthy people who were not uh, very elderly and did not have a lot of comorbid conditions. That's where the 94, 95% protection against hospitalization and death comes from. It doesn't come from going to a nursing home and cough on a bunch of very elderly persons, many of whom have chronic lung disease, heart failure, diabetes, chronic kidney disease on dialysis, and it's going to protect them 90, 95%. That is not what the studies show. And if we don't get the workers in the nursing homes vaccinated, I am fairly convinced that elderly persons who have multiple comorbid conditions will not have the type of protection that we saw in healthy individuals who registered for the original trials. Let me just say also, the um, that's a very good point. And the SEAL team has already uh, established a speaker's bureau. Um, the, the so And they've actually, Dr. Ferdinand has done some. So that, that sort of activity is going on and that's uh, being done in different venues. So uh, once again, partnering with what they're already doing might be, be beneficial. I can tell you one thing that we're planning that as a marketing tool, folks might want to look at. Uh, our center is partnering with the 100 Black Men, and we're going to have an open air health fair in June for Juneteenth to celebrate freedom. And we're tying that messaging into getting vaccinations as part of uh, being free. <laughs> historically. And um, uh, we're doing our testing as well as vaccinations. So I know that chapters in every parish. So that might be something that uh, if uh, the marketing folks want to look at that uh, as a campaign with that theme, you know, particularly as it's targeting African Americans in the whole history behind, you know, Juneteenth, just something to throw out there as a specific targeting uh, uh, activity by a group that has you know, a lot of credibility in the community. And um, um, we're not targeting just African-American men, but the larger community and um, something to think about. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the, the issue around um, uh, uh, talking to providers about messaging. You know, I think a lot of what we're talking about is, is great, but, you know, looking at the urgency of time, is there something we can get out to provide us more quickly than uh, than a webinar in July? That 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 concerns me because, you know, one of the issues that we haven't really talked about in this call is that the longer people delay getting vaccinated, the more space we leave for additional variants to develop. 
And sooner or later, there's going to be a mutation that is going to be able to evade this vaccine. Um, so I, I think that there's more urgency to this. And I think we need, we need to get some messaging out to the providers before July. I mean, even if it's just some talking points that we can send out via, you know, some, some, uh, some kind of mechanism, but. Right. So can we, so as a provider, can, can we get, have a process by which we actually get, you know, something in writing, brochure, whatever, talking yeah. points that I can stick in my office at my, at my intake and registration desk or for our nurses to actually distribute to, to patients as they're doing their triage, et cetera. I mean, if we actually have some standard, you know, well thought out communication points that we can use to distribute and to use for communication like immediately and you distribute those, you make those available to providers. Like our national associations do that for in obstetrics for you know depression screening for tobacco counseling about tobacco or substance abuse yeah. um, interactions etc. Those materials are, are are published and distributed for folk to use. Put that stuff in our hands like now. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if we can get something something out quickly, even if it's something that we can update later or improve on later. But you know, I think this there's a real urgency to this. Dr. Benjamin, something could that come out of your house? Um, you all did a wonderful job with the J&J &J talking point, something as simple as that. I will uh, start working on, I, I will connect with um, Ali and we'll start working on some, see what we can pull up for next week. Okay. Yeah, so so one, um, one thing that'd be helpful, so the, the Lucille also did a survey and they collected some data um, that I, I can I can get that for you that I think would be helpful as well. It might be helpful in, in thinking about some of the um, issues that you need to con combat in these conversations. And I think that'd be valuable to have. Hello, this is uh, Catherine Haywood. Um, I am the director of Louisiana Community Health Outreach yeah. Network. I work with CHWs across the state. And I know you're talking about putting out information for providers but it would be great to have something for community health workers who work within the communities to have talking perks. Um, I also heard something about hesitancy. One of my problems is that there are CHWs who are hesitant in getting the vaccine. And my concern yeah. is how can you go out and convince people if you're not getting it? So my, my thing is I talk about it but it would be helpful to have some other talking perks. I talk about it all the time in trying to get them to have get the vaccination. So I know you're talking about providers, <laughs> but I also feel that we have other people who are out in the community and they're out on the ground who need some information. Yeah, I, I think in that sense, I think they're providers too. I mean, they, they need that same messaging because they're people that are influential. And I would say those that nursing home staff as well are people who are, they're swaying people's opinions and, and, and people, the people in the community are looking at all of them as health professionals, yeah. people who have expertise. So yeah, I think we need to get those talking points out to community health workers, the nursing home staff, we need to get them to every every uh, any uh, physician's office in, in this in this state. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that's a good recommendation that we can certainly move yeah. fairly quickly on that. You yeah. Know, for sure, within the in the next week. Um, I'm gonna read for the public who may be um, can't see the chat just a few little comments in the chat. Dr. Cantor um, posted the percent positivity um, and the regions. There was an, uh, the Northwest region, uh, Caddo and surrounding state flat. Uh, new cases per capita increased uh, in a state and also in all regions except region three and region five, which are river parishes in Lake Charles. Uh, he said of all viruses circulating in Louisiana, the UK, uh, there's a 33% of, of, of that from the UK. Nationally, it's 44%. Uh, Faye Grimsley made a recommendation um, to do some advocacy for senior citizen centers reopening. Um, 
Some senior centers, she says, some senior centers need more assistance and guidance and resources on reopening. Uh, Dr. Canner says it's been 367 breakthrough cases. Uh, those are the individuals who tested positive for COVID 14 or more days after becoming fully vaccinated. And he talked about the percentages of that. Uh, Emily Remington had posted, we don't know the long-term side effects of these vaccines. We do know the long-term side effects of COVID. And I think we've talked about that before. Dr. Maupin, maybe Medicaid can create a specific reimbursement platform to incentivize physicians and nurse practitioners to specifically counsel regarding COVID vaccination. And then Dr. Ferdinand posted the site that uh, from the New York Times regarding the unvaccinated worker. So these are just the chats that we've, we're reading for the public who may be tuned in and don't have access to the chat box. I just kind of noticed that uh, the, from the New York Times that CDC has just released a recommendation to, re, um, to resume use of the J&J &J vaccine with a warning. With a warning? Yes. Well, I mean, I only have the headline. I didn't read the article, okay. but that's but that's what it's saying that, that okay. they're, they're proposing to um, to begin use of the JJ vaccine again. Okay, great. Doctor Brown, can I just? I, I hate to prolong the meeting, but yes. th this this has popped up also, and I don't know if other people are experiencing this. Some of the employers in our community are mandating that their employees, if they don't get vaccinated, they have to continuously test. Uh, and test negative before they uh, uh, come back or, or, or allowed to work. Um, there was some conversations about policy, you know, mandating or, or requiring people to get vaccinated that I don't think legally you can do. But I, I, I didn't know if anyone else was experiencing that, um, that folks are entertaining. You know, there, there's conversations about making it mandatory, which a V safe card that you can't travel uh, unless right. you have vaccinated. So I don't know where we are with that or if that's something that the committee would look at, but I have been having people come in saying that they, they needed to get tested uh, for work. Right. Uh, so that's going to be, that's, I, if that's not a policy that's uh, illegal, then I think that probably is going to be coming up uh, as an issue also. I don't think a number of universities have done, are doing that. Um, that's something we talked about at Tulane and decided not to do, but right. you know, there's been that there's a, I don't know of any university in Louisiana that's doing it, but there, it is happening. Um, we certainly, we require students to get uh, um, all sorts of vaccines before they can right. come on campus. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I don't think the legality of it is in question. It could be done. One of the issues is whether or not you can do that with a vaccine that's only got emergency use authorization. I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, I think the Tulane's legal counsel concluded that we could mandate it, even though it's only emergency use authorization, but still uh, the university, we decided not to do it. But I, I think this is going to be coming up. Some of the nursing homes uh, have, have thought about this. I've been in some conversations with them about it. None, none of them have done it yet either. But I know there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of talk about this. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't know if Assistant Secretary Kim Hood is. Are you still on? She might have logged off. Um, I know she is looking into. She's with the um, Office of Public Health, and she is exploring ways to obtain some additional funding for the task force. Um, and then Secretary Kimberly Robinson, do you have any updates for us at this time? So LBH, LBH has been working on the funding piece as we get more guidance from the um, federal government on the American Rescue Plan funds. So I think that is forthcoming as we find out how we can spend the money that goes into both the LDH pot as well as the, to the state of general. So we're on both the governor's ask list and LDH's ask list for additional right. funding. 
Thank you, Secretary Robinson. Um, Ms. Tracy, are there any public comments? No, ma'am, there aren't any. Okay, are there any other additional comments from the task force before we close, Dr. Lavise? I think I said quite enough today. So I'll, I'll <laughs> out there and just wish everyone a wonderful weekend. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining in and for all of your feedback. Have a great weekend.